have a good time in the pool team? Good time in the pool? Wonderful time in the pool. See all your family in the pool. La novella. Oh, okay. What's it? Okay, well, I'll have to see it if it's on my TV. And uh, uh, probably, yeah. Sydney says I have an addictive personality. So. Um, I was going to say, uh, I was going to congratulate Brad and um, Lindsay, where are you, Brad? Lindsay, there, there's Brad. Brad and Lindsay's getting married. Uh, they've been visiting a little bit. I think I think Lindsay showed up maybe seven or eight months ago, and Brad showed up shortly thereafter. But uh, they're getting married in um, Venice, Florida, right? August twenty sixth. Well, that's great. I'm you're wonderful. You're both believers, committed to Christ, and yeah, born again believers. So it's great. And then uh, some of you have asked about Martha Griggs. I was talking with I called Martha yesterday, and her uh, son Sam. They always sit over here with uh, Sam and Chelsea and three little kids. Uh, Arvis had fallen on Martha. Martha was helping him walk, and uh, he had fallen, and uh, so she was taking the, it says, and go, I said, how's your mother? She's in Gulf Coast, getting an MRI this morning, cracked bone in the knee. Uh, we'll know more later, so some of you have asked about Martha today, so, well, let's, let's pray, so let's confess our sins. Father, um, we acknowledge that you're holy and, and we acknowledge that we're sinners by nature and by choice and we fail to live holy lives. Uh, we fail to trust you in all things and give thanks in all things. We, we fail to rejoice always. We fail to pray about all things. And uh, we worry and we're anxious, we grumble and complain. And we fail to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and we ask that you would forgive us. Forgive us of the sins that we committed without knowing it and uh, forgive us of our sins that we committed intentionally with full knowledge. And um, just have mercy on us and forgive us. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness and restore um, a good, healthy uh, relationship with us. Now let's just praise God for who he is. Just praise him for any of his attributes. Father, we thank you that you're good and kind and compassionate. Well, we praise you because you're generous and faithful. And uh, we praise you because you're gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. Well, we praise you because you're the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the only living and true God. We praise you because uh, you're the ju you're a jealous God. 
who wants our devotion, our faithfulness, and we praise you because you're the judge of all mankind. We praise you because you're from everlasting to everlasting, and you never grow weary or tired. And we praise you that you're sovereign over all things. Now let's just give God thanks for anything that uh, you want to thank him for. Our Father, we thank you for life itself. And we thank you um, for hope that we have of eternal life in heaven um, when we die here on earth. We thank you for the hope that we have of uh, reunion with our loved ones who have died in Christ. We thank you um, for the hope that uh, if we lay up treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust can destroy, that you'll reward us. And we thank you for the Bible, that we don't have to uh, wonder what you're like or speculate or imagine what you're like, but that you've revealed yourself to us in your word. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that indwells us until the day of redemption. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who lived the sinless life that we couldn't live and died in our place. And we thank you for our families. Thank you for our friends. And we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for um, our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we just ask that you would help us to be thankful, grateful people. Uh, thank you for our prosperity. Thank you for our freedom. Uh, we acknowledge that everything that we have comes from your hand, and it can be taken away from us at any moment. Now, just spend some time asking God for anything that your heart desires. Father, I ask that uh, more and more people might honor you, respect you, love you, and serve you as the only living and true God. And we pray that uh, Christianity would spread here in the United States and around the world. We ask, Lord, that uh, the churches would teach the truth and be un uncompromising in teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and calling sin, sin. And we pray for the believers in the churches that you would protect them from the evil one and that you would help us to walk in obedience and be holy because you're holy. We ask that your will would be done in our lives individually, and that your will would be done in our lives corporately as a church. Help us to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves and help us to love our fellow believers as you have loved us. Help us to forgive one another, and comfort one another, and encourage one another, and pray for one another. And I ask for Martha Griggs, just comfort her at, and Arvis at this time. I pray that the doctors would be able to fix her knee in a very non- aggressive procedure that she could recover from, that she would uh, have the opportunity to see her grandchildren grow up to love you. And uh, pray for Arvis that you'd help him to think clearly and that he'd be able to walk without difficulty and without falling. 
I pray for Jack Benson that he would recover fully from his hip surgery and his wife Kathleen that uh, she would recover fully from her shoulder surgery. And uh, Lord, uh, just I ask that you would show yourself strong on behalf of the people here that, that you would answer their prayers and they would give you the honor and the glory you deserve. I thank you for bringing Brad and Lindsay together. And uh, I ask that uh, you would give them a lifelong marriage filled with love, that uh, Brad would love Lindsay as Christ loved the church, and that he would be a good, good husband, and that Lindsay would respect Brad and, and honor him, and that uh, she would be a wonderful helpmate to encourage him to walk with Jesus Christ. And just, just bless her marriage and uh, graciously provide for them. And we just ask that our children and grandchildren would establish Christian marriages, that we would marry Christian spouses and, and um, you would allow us to pass genuine Christianity on to the next generation. So we ask that you'd regenerate the hearts of our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I pray for Cassidy and Pierce that you bring them to faith in Christ. I pray for Blaine that you might bring him to faith in Christ. I ask that you would um, be with Holly and Jasper and Shay, that you would give them strength and they would love you and that you would protect them from evil people and that you would protect them from the evil one. <clears throat> I pray for Dan and Tanya as they're driving today that uh, you'd keep them safe and that uh, when they arrive in Michigan that uh, they would find Christian fellowship, people that would encourage Stephen to grow in his faith in Christ. And I ask that you'd replace them with uh, another family here. Once again, Father, I ask that you would uh, help us. Um, you know more people than we do. And I just pray that you would send us some young families to pass in and Christianity on to. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Gonna look a little further at Acts. I'm not whoa. <clears throat> Sometimes I think the anesthesia has affected me. It usually affects me when Cindy asks me to do something I don't want to do. I'm th I, I've been thinking, what am I going to do when I, when I don't have this excuse? She's going to expect me to start taking out the trash. But, uh, well, hopefully with no knee pain, I'll do it uh, willingly. I want to... In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a, Gwen, you threw the party, a little get up going away party for Tanya. Did you have a good time? Okay. Yeah, I mean, were, were they still packing? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, it's hard to see people move away. Hopefully, uh, we've got to move some people in. This is what it says. <clears throat> this has always been one of my favorite verses since I was young. But without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so what I want to say is, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Uh, biblical faith is the act of uh, believing, trusting, and relying on God and his word. And this verse tells us uh, that absolutely nothing that man can do will please God apart from believing and trusting and relying on him. In other words, true biblical faith is made up of three things. One, first of all, knowledge. 
a person cannot believe in what they do not know. If I don't know it, I can't believe it. So there has to be knowledge of God. Secondly, agreement. A person can know something and yet not believe it. Therefore, agreement must go with knowledge for biblical faith. Uh, I know something and I agree with it. And thirdly, there has to be a commitment to trust in it, to act on it, to live in light of it. I know it, I agree with it, and I commit myself to it. And so without faith, it is impossible to please God. For example, the, the only way a person to be justified or declared not guilty by God is through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So there's only one way, only way for a person to be justified or declared not guilty by God is through faith in Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul, he, he's talking to Peter here in Galatians, and he tells Peter, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, we know that a man is not justified, and justified is a legal term, means declared not guilty, as I've said, that a man is not justified by observing the law or being good, they are declared not guilty by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, we know that. Peter, you know that, I know that. So, since we know that, we too have put our faith in Christ. Jesus, that we may be justified. We have put our faith in Christ, Jesus, that we may be declared not guilty by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. And uh, <clears throat> so imagine a fire breaks out. There's a fire that your, your family got relocated to a house. Is that right? Uh, were they on the first floor of their fire? First floor, not the second floor or third floor. Okay. Well, imagine a fire breaks out <clears throat> on the first floor of a three-story house. And then there's a child trapped um, in the third story. And, and the child is crying for help from the window. <clears throat> if the child jumps, he will be killed because the window is too high and concrete underneath. But there's a strong fireman standing on the ground yelling at the child to jump and he will catch it. Well, in order to be saved from the fire, by faith in the fireman, the child must know that the fireman is on the ground yelling at him to jump and he will catch him. The child must believe that the fireman is strong enough to catch him and um, the child must exercise his faith in the fireman by jumping, committing and jumping into the fireman's arms in order to be saved from the fire. And committing himself to jumping out of the third story window and into the firearms, fireman's arms is proof from the child that the child has faith in the fireman to save him. And in the same way, a sinful human being may know that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, who lived a sinless life, died on the cross as their substitute to pay the penalty for God's wrath for their sin, and rose physically from the dead on the third day and ascended into heaven. They may know that. A lot of people have been, attended churches that have taught that. A sinful human being may wholeheartedly agree that Jesus Christ is God's one and only Savior, provided for sinful human beings, and that Jesus Christ is able to save him or them from the penalty of their sin, but they're not saved until as an act of the will they believe in, they trust in, and they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they cling only to him for their salvation. There are a lot of people who have knowledge. There are a lot of people who agree uh, knowledge about Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people that um, agree with it, but they stop short of committing, they're trusting in, 
receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior and clinging only to him for their salvation. The question is, have you and I been saved and have we obtained eternal life? Have we been justified through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, but it's impossible without faith that is impossible to please God. Now, once we are justified by God, we're to live the Christian life by faith. Now, Paul wrote the believers in Galatia, or Romans, actually, it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, to the folks in Galatia, it says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, he told the believers in Corinth that he and his partners in their missionary endeavor, we live by faith and not by sight. And what, what does living by faith mean for us? Uh, living by faith means that we believe that God exists. There is a God. And that he always keeps his promises. A lot of people in our society don't believe in God. But living by faith means that we believe that God exists and always keeps his promises. Living by faith means that we believe and live with the confidence that God has saved us from eternal separation from him. A lot of people think when in our culture believe that when you die, the lights just go out. We believe there's eternity in heaven and eternal in, eternity in hell. So living by faith means we believe and live with the confidence that God has saved us from the penalty of our sins, from eternal separation from him. Living by faith means that we believe and live as though God lives within us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us in this life. And when we experience physical death, we will go immediately into his presence in heaven. No, I'm not sure. Let's see. I got pages two and three mixed up there. In living by faith means that, that we live and believe with the confidence that God will never let anything come into our lives that we cannot bear. That he hears and answers our prayers for our own good and his glory. There is a prayer here in God. Living by faith means that we believe and live with the confidence that our Heavenly Father will supply all our food, all our clothing and shelter in this life as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And that we believe that God is actively working all things together for in our lives for our good and his glory. But living by faith means that we believe and live with the confidence that God, obeying God's commands will bring God's blessing. And disobeying God's commands will bring his discipline to his children so that they, they or we will share in his holiness. Living by faith means that we obey God's commands in spite of our feelings, our circumstances, or our consequences. You know, God wants his children to mature to a place where they have an abiding trust in him so that the highly anxious moments of their life can be faced with peace and calmness. God wants his children to believe that he is a good heavenly father, as we sang this morning, who takes care of his children. And he takes care of his children until he calls them home. You now, sometimes I think that it's easy to trust God when you're 20. It's harder to trust God, I think, as you age. I don't know. Anybody want to disagree with me? Yeah, we still have to trust him. Uh, God wants his children to believe that he is a good heavenly father who takes good care of his children until he calls them home. Now, I've got some long illustrations um, this morning. And some of them are, well, two of them are on finances. Because... I think, I think that um, one of the hardest things to trust God for are finances. And um, also, I was, I was a missionary at one time, and 
and raised support. And Anne, Anne, do you raise support with Reach Global? And, and you, that's the part of your job you really enjoy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, you just have to trust God. And Roger's dad was there, you know. He would leave you in Kenya and come back to the States and raise support. Is that right? At times? At a time or two. You what? You behaved while he was gone? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this, this, is, this is a story about Hudson Taylor. It's Hudson Taylor, I looked him up this morning on Wikipedia. He was born in 1832. He died in 1905. He uh, was the founder of African Inland Mission and uh, had a significant eternal impact in China. Uh, he was, he was uh, studying medicine in, in uh, Kensington, um, England, and he, uh, at the age of 18, he moved to a very poor section, poor community in England. And so he, he writes this, he says, uh, his faith was tested one night a, a poorly dressed man came and asked Hudson to come and pray for the soul of his wife who was dying. Uh, Hudson agreed to go and pray for her, but, but as they were talk, walking to the man's apartment, Hudson began to wonder if he had made the right decision because a gentleman told him that he and his family had no money left at all. And Hudson reached into his pocket, felt the one solitary coin in his pocket. See, it's hard for me to imagine somebody having nothing in our society or having just one coin left, you know? But that's what Hudson says here. He says, this man said that he and his family had no money left at all. And he reached into his pocket and felt the one solitary coin in his pocket. It was all that he had Besides, he was starving himself, and except for the two bowls of porridge in his room, he had neither food nor money. And surely God wouldn't want him to give away the only coin he had. If only he had two coins, he would be happy to give the man one. And when Hudson arrived at the man's home, the dim light from the cheap candle revealed an exhausted woman and a baby not two days old. Did I, hear, I, did I hear a baby when I was praying? I thought it was my imagination because, was that Ada? Okay. Oh, this, this little woman had a, that Hudson was visiting was a, had a baby two days old. She was lying on a thin straw mattress in a corner. And standing or lying on the floor were four or five other children in old clothes without shoes or socks and large hungry eyes. And Hudson thought, oh, if I only had two coins, I would certainly give one to these poor people. But I only have one. And he, had, he began to tell these people about God. He told them, you know, things are very bad for you now, but you must not be cast down. We have a Father in heaven who loves us and cares for us. And if we trust him, and at that point, Hudson couldn't go on. The words seemed to stick in his throat and something inside him seemed to say, you hypocrite. How can you tell these people about the kind and loving Father in heaven who can be trusted when you're not willing to trust him yourself without your money? And so Hudson gave up trying to preach and felt very depressed. He thought, these people don't know that, that I only have one coin left in the whole, whole world. If I... If only I had more, I, I would give something to them. I really would. And he turned to the man and he said, you asked me to come and pray for your wife. Let's pray. No sooner had he begun to pray than that accusing voice within him said, that coin in your pocket. But Hudson kept praying, however, feeling more and more miserable. And when he had finished, the man said to him in desperation, you can see what a terrible state we're in, sir. For God's sake, help us. 
And suddenly Hudson remembered something he had read in the Bible, Matthew 5.42, give to the one who asks you. And so the, in his mind, there was nothing left to do. The coin would have to go. And slowly he put his hand in his pocket, pulled out the coin and gave it to the man. And surprisingly, he began to feel quite cheerful. He told the man, you may think I'm well off, but that's, not, that's all the money I have in the world. But what I've been telling you is true. God really is a father and we can trust him. I can trust him. And he realized he could. And Hudson found himself speaking with great assurance and confidence about trusting God now that the money was out of his pocket in the, and in the man's. He was amazed at the difference it made in his feelings. He felt great. And as he made his way home, he didn't have a care in the world. He held his head high, had a skip in his step, and sang as loud as he could sing. And that night, he remembered a verse in, in the Bible. He that giveth to the poor, lendeth to the Lord. Proverbs 19, 17. So when he knelt to pray before going to bed, he asked God to repay the loan soon. Otherwise, he would have no dinner the next day. And the following morning, as he looked at his last bowl of porridge, he wondered when God would repay that loan. And within a few seconds, his landlady appeared at his door. Here's a little package for you, Mr. Taylor, she said. Oh, thank you, replied Hudson, rather surprised. And he took it from her and he looked at it. It was addressed to him, all right, but he did not recognize the writing. The postmark was blurred, so that did not help him either. And he decided to open it. Slitting the envelope, he drew out a sheet of paper. Inside was a pair of gloves and a gold coin. He stared at it in amazement, looked through the paper wrapping for a letter, scanned the handwriting and the postmark for a clue as to where it came from. But at that moment, he really didn't care. As far as he was concerned, it had come straight from heaven. It dawned on him that not only had his silver coin been returned, but 10 times more. Have you ever gotten a check with the envelope return address heaven? I haven't either. How about you? No, <clears throat> not yet. You know, if we're going to live by faith uh, and please God, we, we must believe, trust, and rely on and act on his promises concerning giving. Uh, and I've, I've told the story many times. I went into a church that had had a church split. And uh, the rumor was going around town was that our church would collapse because we wouldn't be able to pay the mortgage. And every, every meeting I would go to, um, th there would be a discussion that we have to cut the missionary support to pay the mortgage. And uh, every, every, every meeting we would table it. And, uh, and then one night there was a Mildred Robinson. She was in her 80s. Uh, she, she was a, and she says, if this church is going to fail, let's go down, fail, let's, let's fail trusting God. Let's continue to support the missionaries and see what God will do. And so that's what we did. We never cut the missionaries. We continue to um, support the missionaries. And within a few years, we had our mortgage paid off. And um, so, but have, have you ever failed to obey God because of fear? Uh, well, how, how does that make you feel when, it, when you, it, it made Hudson Taylor feel miserable? And how do you feel when you obey God? I hope you feel better. Uh, the question is, is God pleased with our faith? Do we have enough faith in God to step out and take a small risk? And are we willing to test his promises to find out if they're trustworthy? Uh, Jesus said, when I did my internship in Briarwood Presbyterian Church, I mean, if you've ever been through Birmingham, today they it's up on a hill. Uh, I'm going to say it's between seven and 10,000. When I was there, it was a couple thousand. But every time they passed the offering plate, every Sunday, 
I was there. Frank Barker, the pastor, would quote this verse when they gave when they took up the offering. And this is uh, this is Jesus, and he would say, "Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with you, the measure you use, it will be measured to you." And uh, and so Frank would always say that, and God graciously provided for that church. And they supported more missionaries with Campus Crusade than any other church in the country. Um, faith believes that God is still there even when it looks like he isn't. You know, sometimes God doesn't answer his promises or answer a person's prayers immediately. Sometimes God allows bad things to happen to people. And unfortunately, when that happens, some people lose their faith in God's existence. You know, we were talking about a couple of people this morning that um, at one time claimed to be believers, and now they say they no longer believe in God. But, but that was not the case with Abraham. In fact, I was disappointing yesterday. I was reading for my sermon and you know, there are all kinds of form, I, forums out there on the internet. And I got on a forum where people were saying why they left Christianity. And, and it was kind of sad, the reasons that they had. And I told Randy when I visited with him, the reason they left Christianity is because they wanted to sin and didn't want to repent. Or they wanted to accept the sin of other people. And uh, that's a sorry state. They choose that they would rather sin, live in sin, than repent and come be clean before God. Well, God promised to give Abraham a son with his wife, Sarah. And when Abraham was about 70 years old, and Sarah was 60 years old at the time, and Abraham and Sarah waited 30 years for God to keep his promise, to give him his son through Sarah. And during that 30 years, Abraham never stopped believing God's promise. And I like these verses. Uh, you would like to think that, our, as I said, that our faith would get stronger. And, and I said in Sunday school, I, what I was really looking for is is because I came across an article s s earlier where the person had given up Christianity because of false predictions on the rapture. He had grown up in the 70s with Hal Lindsey's like Great Planet Earth book, and Christ was going to come back in the early 80s, and you had Lindsey saying Christ was going to come back in the 80s, Chuck Smith saying Christ was going to come back in the early 80s, and he didn't. And then you had... 87 reasons why Christ was coming in 87 and 88 reasons why Christ was coming in 88. And, and then when you think about it, then Jack Van Impey, I heard him say that Christ was going to come in the year 2000. And Harold Camping then, was it 2011? And you get all these false predictions and, and people that are, are living. Well, what does the Bible say about that? No man knows. No man knows. And, and, and what, what, what happens when he doesn't come, when these people predict, it weakens people's faith. Well, what we should say, he didn't come last year, but that we know he's coming. And it should, our strength, our faith should get stronger the longer he doesn't come. That he will come because he's promised. We don't know when, but he's promised and he will come. We know that. He doesn't lie. In Romans 4, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. And this is what I like. Without weakening in his faith, 
He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Without weakening in his faith, he looked at the circumstances and he said, my body's dead, Sarah's womb is also dead. Yet he did not waver in unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Well, how, how do we react? When our circumstances look as though God's not going to fulfill a promise to us, or that God has abandoned us, um, he doesn't answer prayer as quickly as we want him to. Uh, does our faith in him grow stronger, or does our faith in God grow weaker? Do we waver in unbelief and even begin to question the existence of God? Are we, are we fully persuaded that God exists and ha he has the power to do what he has promised? And uh, as we say, he, he fulfills all his promises. He's faithful. He doesn't lie. And nothing and no one can keep his, from fulfilling his promises to us. And then the last section here we want to look at, faith believes that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. Um, in order to please God, it's necessary to believe that he is moral, he's just, and, and God will reward faith in him. Again and again, the Bible teaches that God is a loving God. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a forgiving and merciful God who rewards those who seek and obey him. The psalmist says, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. As Psalm 84, 11, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. The Bible says if you obey the Lord, you will prosper spiritually and you'll enjoy the assurance of your salvation. You have peace of mind and joy in the midst of the trials of life. And you'll find that the Lord is faithful to keep his promises. And the last illustration is a little bit about money, too, but this is Brother Andrew. You ever read any books about Brother Andrew? Yeah. Um, he, I, God Smuggler was the book that I read, and he was smuggling Bibles into the um, Iron Curtain countries when uh, Bibles were illegal there. And he would pull up to the border stop and say, um, God, make the He'd have the back seat full of Bibles and he'd ask that God would blind the guard's eyes and he'd get through, you know. But this is what he, he tells this story about by his, uh, an experience in Bible school or seminary. He says, <clears throat> it soon came time for me to head out on the first of several training trips in evangelism. Uh, his professor said, you're, you're going to like this, Andy. It's an exercise in trust. The rules are simple. Each student on your team is given a one pound bank note. Uh, with that, you go on a missionary tour through Scotland. Uh, you're expected to pay your own transportation, your own lodging, your food, any advertising you want to do, renting of halls, providing refreshments. And Andrew said, all on one pound note? Worse than that, the professor said, when you get back to school after four weeks, you're expected to pay back the pound. I, la I laughed, Andy said. It sounds like we'll be passing the offering plate all the time. And the professor said, oh, you're not allowed to take up offerings. Never. You're not to mention money at your meetings. All of your needs have got to be provided without any manipulation on your part or the experiments of failure. He says, I was a member of a team of five boys. Later, when I tried to reconstruct where our funds came from during those four weeks, it was hard to. It seemed like that what we needed was always just there. Sometimes a letter would arrive from one of the boys' parents with a little money. 
Sometimes we would get a check in the mail from a, a church we had visited days or weeks earlier. The notes that came with these gifts were always interesting. People would write and say things like, I know you don't need money, or you would have mentioned it, but God just wouldn't let me get to sleep tonight until I put this in an envelope for you. <clears throat> Contributions came frequently in the form of produce. <coughs> like this, Gwen. Town in the island, island, we were given 600 eggs. You have some chickens, don't you? Every once in a while, you give some, uh, some eggs to people here at the church. Well, they got 600 eggs at one time. <clears throat> he said, we had eggs for breakfast, eggs for lunch, eggs as hors d'oeuvres before dinner of eggs with an egg white meringue dessert. It was weeks before we could look a chicken in the eye. <laughs> but money or produce, uh, we stuck fast to two rules. We never mentioned a need out loud. And we gave away a tithe and that he means here a 10% 10, 10 of whatever came in to us as soon as we got it within 24 hours. So whatever came in, they, they gave 10% of it away within 24 hours, if possible. Now, and believing you can never outgive God. Um, another team that set out from school at the same time as we did was not so strict about giving 10% away or giving away whatever voluntarily and cheerfully. They set aside their 10%, all right, but they didn't give it away immediately in case they ran into an emergency. And of course they had emergencies. So did we every day. But they ended their month owing money to hotels, lecture halls, markets all over Scotland while we came back to school with almost 10 pounds a head. Fast as we could give money away, God was always swifter, and we ended with money to send to the Lord's work overseas. <clears throat> and as I say, I, I honestly think money is one of the hardest things for people to trust God with because we all need it. And to a certain extent, it's our security. And... Um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I, I don't I don't have a problem with giving God a, a percentage of what he gives me because if he gives me nothing, he gets nothing. The onus is on him to give to me first. And I think by giving a percentage of what he gives me first back is saying to him, I trust you uh, to provide for me more than this gift. You know, the, the gift is gone quickly. The money is gone quickly, but God is eternal. And he always has that power to provide. So um, do, do we believe that God is a rewarder of those who seek him? Or, or do we think he, he wants to ruin our lives? Uh, do we have a desire to know and walk with God? Do, do, do we seek him diligently? As I say, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith believes that God is still there even when it looks like he isn't. And <clears throat> I'll quit. On, I read the article in Sunday school. I'll, I'm, give me three minutes. I talked to Adam Marie, our missionary, yesterday. And she just made this comment about seminaries having trouble. And so this morning I woke up about 5.30 and I thought, well, I wonder what. So I, I Googled seminaries closing or Bible schools closing in the United States. And first article came out. Um, it was uh, 2020, I think, at that time. And it said that um, Gordon Conwell Seminary was uh, selling off 102 acres of their land and that their uh, enrollment had dropped from 2,100 to 1,200. They just couldn't make it financial. 
in one of the other articles, and in the same article, it said that Trinity had run into a lot of trouble and they had eliminated a lot of faculty. Uh, Trinity is the evangelical preachers. So then I looked at, at another article, it's like Bethel College had, had eliminated 25 professors and they just went down the whole list of Christian colleges and, and how they were struggling. And uh, I told the Sunday school class, I Googled a guy that, grad, that was in seminary with me. He was a lot smarter than I was. And uh, I think he went to Dallas and got his doctorate and became a, a seminary professor or a Bible school professor. And I Googled him and I found him. He was waiting tables at a restaurant. I thought, that's odd. And the Bible college that he was teaching at closed. So there was a, it was in downtown Omaha. And they just didn't have the money. It's gone. So we, we don't live in a heyday for Christianity here in the United States. It's, it's, not, it's not the way it was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So sometimes it seems that God has abandoned us, faith, but faith believes that God st is still there even when it looks like he isn't. And wouldn't it be great if 10, 15 years ago from now we pick up our phone and we, we Google an article and we find out the seminaries and the Bible colleges in the United States are overflowing with students. And the churches are, um, are doing great as well. But faith believes that God is still there even when it looks like he isn't. And faith believes that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Ask God to increase your faith. Read the Bible to know how God, loving, good, powerful, how loving, good, powerful, and trustworthy God is. Learn his promises and trust in them. Learn his commands and obey him. And one of the things Heather Marie said, and I was trying to get my head around it, maybe we figured that out in Sunday school. She said one of the problems that Trinity was having with these online courses is that non-Christians were taking the courses. And then we got to, I got to thinking in Sunday school and we beat it around. Are non-Christians taking seminary courses and interacting with the seminary students to undermine their faith in Christ? You understand what I'm saying? Because you can, there's anonymity online. And so a non-Christian can get into a class and question everything that the professor's teaching, everything that the Bible says to undermine, undermine the faith of the, the others in the class. So I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, Ed Marie's going to come September 15th. So, uh, but God is there. We need to learn his promises and trust in him, learn his commands and obey him. You know, perhaps our reward for seeking God is in heaven rather than on earth. But as Jim Elliott, a missionary who was martyred in the 50s, said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Uh, Hebrews 11.6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Uh, Father, we ask that you would strengthen our faith in God's existence uh, and that you would uh, strengthen our faith in that he is a good God and he rewards those who diligently seek him. Help us to live our lives by faith. Uh, help us not to be afraid or anxious about the future because our faith is in you and your promises to take care of us. Your promise to take us to heaven and give us a home where there's no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. Uh, help us to be strong in the face of uh, the challenges to Christianity in our culture. We ask this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor. I invite you all to rise again.
and join us in praise singing what a friend